party Nuclear in its hot current seat. form. What it's are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we take a look at last Sunday's historic People's Climate Change March in New York City, and we do so from three different angles. Michael Marriott, the president of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NIRS, provided key national organizing that helped deliver thousands of anti-nuclear demonstrators to the event. Gail Payne not only marched, she designed those terrific posters featuring King Kong, Kong standing for coal, oil, nuclear, and gas. And all of it featured the Empire State Building in the background. And Boston's Sheila Parks provides an inspiring personal vision of what the march meant to her. You'll hear from those people, plus numbnuts of the week, activist shout-out, and more nuclear information than you ever thought possible. All coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, September 23, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards do shrink, and the news, it really stinks. From Japan, newly published data shows record levels of strontium-90 have been detected at all six seawater monitoring locations in front of the destroyed Fukushima Daiichi reactors. At three of the six locations, levels are around triple the previous record set last year. Yet, a report released by TEPCO only days later after that data was released claims, quote, Results indicate efforts to protect water are succeeding. Inside the port area, concentrations of radioactivity have been steadily decreasing. Strontium-90 has been reduced to approximately a third of earlier levels. No, guys, it's three times as much as the previous record, not one-third. Didn't they teach you fractions in school? Now, according to the Japan Times, more recent published data show that strontium-90 concentrations are at record levels in groundwater just 100 feet from the ocean. Gross beta has risen to 720 million becquerels per cubic meter which is 25,000 times higher, 25,000 times higher than it was only eight months ago. TEPCO has still been limping along with one of their worst ideas, and that was the frozen wall around reactor buildings to contain the water. And now, because they can't get their slushy to freeze into popsicles, they're thinking of concreting some of the tunnels. And the Nuclear Regulatory Authority of Japan has given them approval. To which Fukuleaks and Simply Ippo asked in this article, why did no one try to concrete these tunnels back in 2011 as they leaked highly contaminated water into the sea? More truth is being spoken. Dr. Ronald McCoy, a doctor in Japan, said, the truth is that no one in the world really knows how to deal with the Fukushima accident. Murphy's Law is inexorable. If anything can go wrong, in time, it will go wrong. A major nuclear accident can render large areas of land uninhabitable for thousands of years. Beverly Findlay Kaneko, who is the co-producer of Nuclear Hot Seats Voices from Japan series, was interviewed on Social Uplift Radio, and she said, The contamination is now flowing towards the Tokyo area, contaminating the Tokyo water supply. So environmentally, things have not gotten better. They're actually only getting worse. 
Drs. Ferenc Dalnoki Vererius and Dr. Arjun Makajani in the Asian Pacific Journal of December 19, 2011 are quoted as saying, some of the fuel has reached the concrete floor and may breach it, posing a threat of unremediable contamination of groundwater. Contrast that with the statement made in October of 2013 by Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby, promoting Tokyo as the site for the 2020 Summer Olympics. He said to the International Olympic Committee in front of the entire world, quote, Some may have concerns about Fukushima. Let me assure you, the situation is under control. It has never done, and it will never do, any damage to Tokyo. End quote. Young athletes of the world, especially those of you who are currently 10 to 16 years old, are you hearing this? You might want to sit the 2020 games out. Meanwhile, TEPCO is trying to convince local fishermen up in Fukushima Prefecture that it's going to be perfectly okay for them to discharge processed contaminated water from the crippled nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean. Apparently, the fishermen aren't buying it. I can't believe anything TEPCO says, one of the attendees said after the meeting. Under the plan, tainted water stored in 42 wells outside the reactor buildings would be pumped into the nearby sea, meaning the Pacific, after undergoing a purification process. The site generates about 400 tons of contaminated water a day from groundwater flowing into the four reactor buildings. Near the end of the meeting, TEPCO, the Central Government and Fishery Association members, agreed to pursue the issue on another occasion, thus kicking the can down the road yet again. To counter all that bad news, Today, Tuesday, September 23rd, 16,000 demonstrators showed up in one of the largest anti-nuclear demonstrations in Japan since the government's September 10 announcement that they had approved plans to restart two reactors at the Sendai plant in southern Japan. Nobel Literature Laureate Kenzaburo Oe told the Tokyo Rally, The government is going ahead with the plan to resume operation at the Sendai plant without compiling sufficient anti-disaster plans. In a related and highly ironic story, on Monday, September 22nd, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby said that Japan will not restart its closed nuclear power plants, quote, unless safety is restored 100 percent, end quote. If that statement is true, that means that there's not going to be a restart ever of any nuclear power plants in Japan. But I guess we need to define the word safety. That's his loophole. Over to the U.S., where we have more bad news from the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Investigation suggests that another drum with plutonium has ruptured at this U.S. nuclear site. Joe Franco, manager of the U.S. Energy Department field office in Carlsbad that oversees the plant, told a public meeting, Investigation of the underground suggests the rupture of an additional barrel of nuclear waste. This second container of plutonium-contaminated debris may have contributed to the radiation leak. Terry Wallace, an official with the Los Alamos National, meaning nuclear, laboratory, said, I cannot guarantee that second drum won't go. Reactions could have heated this drum up to the point where you would begin to have a reaction. Wallace added, The breached drum was originally white. It's now black. New Mexico State Senator Peter Wirth, a Democrat from Santa Fe, was both blunt and succinct. He said, the WIP area where the drum is stored has not been sealed, and the Department of Energy has not presented a promised recovery plan for cleaning up WIP. He said, 16 drums contain disturbing mixtures of waste. 
Twelve of the drums containing waste identified as high risk are at WIP, 11 of them in panel six, which includes the waste container identified as a potential powder keg. That panel cannot be immediately accessed in a way that ensures radiation will not escape. To which Joe Franco from the Department of Energy responded, We've taken into consideration what if we had that event again while our folks are in the underground. We're taking things seriously. Oh, good, Joe Franco. I would hope so. We'll aim for an update on this story next week with Don Hancock of Southwest Information and Resource Center. The Hanford site in southeast Washington is back in the news where it shows up regularly. This time, further news about the anencephaly cluster that has happened in the three counties that contain and are adjacent to the Hanford site. In a report by Jonelle Alicia, a former NBC News reporter, five pregnancies with anencephaly in central Washington state have shown up with due dates this year. This is an extremely high rate of babies missing part of their brain, or skull. In this area since 2010, 32 babies have been born without parts of the skull and brain, which is the definition of anencephaly. Based on these numbers, the Department of Health says that this area is four times the national average in the terms of these birth defects. But it's believed that the numbers are actually higher than that because physicians in Washington are not required to report birth defects. Hospitals are also allowed to code any termination or miscarriage as complication of pregnancy, and there are many families that choose to abort once they find out their unborn child has a defect. These are not counted in the national average. Further, these numbers do not take into account babies born with spina bifida, which is where part of their spinal cord is sticking out. In a report that has been removed from the state health department's website, it stated, quote, studies reported an association between neural tube defects, meaning anencephaly and spina bifida, and the radiation dose the fathers received. This effect was observed in children whose parents received low doses while working at Hanford. Other research suggests there is reason to believe that radiation exposure before pregnancy can increase the frequency of birth defects. This state-sponsored report went on, The study of birth defects in Washington's Benton and Franklin counties near Hanford examined the number of cases of certain birth defects between 1968 and 1980. There were more neural tube defects than expected. Conclusion? As with other health effects from radiation, it is assumed that any exposure to radiation carries some risk of genetic effects and birth defects. Two additional stories about Hanford this week, and we will link to them both on our website. In the first, Trisha Pritikin, a Hanford downwinder, was interviewed by Talking Stick TV and reports on the number of people in her family who died bizarre deaths after radiation exposure at Hanford. Her description of the deaths and the cancers is quite graphic. I won't be reading it here, but like I said, there will be a link to it up on the website, as will be a link to a King 5 Seattle story. This is the NBC station in Seattle that has the brilliant coverage of award-winning journalist Susanna Frame, the only television reporter in the country who is regularly assigned to cover and do investigative reports on nuclear problems that impact the local community. This was a story on an environmental specialist, a safety specialist, who was fired from her job at Hanford after raising concerns about safety. Doing her job gets fired. Look under nuclear hot seat number 170, and you will find links to both of these stories. Just now getting word that immediately after Fukushima happened, fallout in California was thousands of times higher than expected for several days. Isn't it nice to get the nuclear news when there's still time to do something about it?
Which brings us to nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. The World Nuclear Association's 2014 Annual Symposium provides enough numb nutsery to make the steam come out of my ears for the rest of this year. However, one piece that they published and sent around as an editorial has struck me as one of the funniest things I have ever seen come out of the nuclear industry. That is an editorial they wrote to try and coach their people in how to change out their language when speaking to bankers. In other words, they just translated how their wording is interpreted by people in the financial community. For example, when the industry says latest technology, a bank hears first-of-a-kind risk. Industry says proven safety record. The bank remembers Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, Fukushima. Industry says construction schedule and the bank worries about delays and cost overruns. Industry says peaceful use. Bank considers nuclear proliferation. Industry says well-regulated industry. The bank asks about the host country regulator. The industry says localization. Bank supply chain risk. Industry says with government support. The bank worries about political risk and a Germany-style phase-out. The industry says contracts for difference or long-term purchase power agreements. Whatever that means, the bank acknowledges state aid investigations. The industry claims long-term economics. The bank hears electricity market risk. And the industry says new nuclear program. What the bank hears? Host country commitment and resources. So, folks, if you have any input to financial institutions that may be thinking about investing in nuclear, throw around some of those terms and let the bank's brains go, and reject the deal. And that's why thank you to World Nuclear News for this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. We'll have our special report on the People's Climate Change March in just a moment. But first, what does it mean when you get trapped one mile away from a nuclear accident when it's in the process of happening? That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. In fact, I wrote an e-book about it. Yes, I glow in the dark, one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. It's available through Amazon Kindle. You can download software for free and play it on any digital device that you do have. And I know that I promised a special price on this for my birthday, and I simply haven't been able to figure out how to change that yet. But I promise, I promise by next week, we will have a special limited period of time price to celebrate my landmark birthday. And trust me, it will be less than the number of years that I have lived on this earth. So that's, yes, I glow in the dark, one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond, coming soon to a digital device that you own. Trust me, you'll like it. This past Sunday, September 21st, 2014, marked the largest climate change march in the planet's history. More than 400,000 people, and that's by the official estimate, so it was probably more than that, but it was more than 400,000 people who flooded the streets of New York with their banners, signs, costumes, bands, giant puppets, rude chants, and the combined energy of activists from across the country and, yes, around the world. Talk about the activists linking. Anti-nuclear forces were out in strength to put our nukes are not green message onto the climate change table and into the conversation, whether 350.org likes it or not. So how did it go? What was it like on the ground? To learn, I spoke with three activists for their perspectives on this historic event. First, we hear from Michael Marriott, current president and former executive director of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NEARS. NEARS provided the central organizing for the anti-nuclear presence at the event. We spoke with Michael, who was still hoarse from all the shouting, just this morning, just two days after everything happened. Michael, 
Mears took a primary position in coordinating the anti-nuclear groups for the climate rally. How did you build participation nationally? We decided early on when, when we first heard that Bill McKibben had called for a People's Climate March and that he was hoping it would be the largest climate march in history, we decided just about immediately that unlike all previous climate events, that we wanted to make a strong statement that nuclear power is not an answer to climate change and that, in fact, the answer to climate change is a nuclear-free, carbon-free energy system. So we were one of the very early groups to join on and endorse the march and begin coordinating with the march organizers and begin organizing to create the largest possible nuclear-free, carbon-free coalition we could. And we did it through all the different online means as well as a lot of phone calls. And, uh, you know, we had one person working full-time doing nothing but calling our members in New York State. All the different means you can think of, we tried, and it worked. Where did people come from? How far away? We had people from all over the country. We actually had quite a few people from California who showed up not only for the march, but uh, a few people from California showed up for the Saturday strategy session for nuclear-free, climate-free activists that we held. Uh, because, you know, one thing that we wanted to make sure of from the very beginning was that the march itself was not an end in itself. I mean, the point was not just to get a lot of people there, although that was important, but the point was to use this as an opportunity to build and strengthen the entire movement. And so we not only did the march, but we also, you know, created an ongoing listserv we held a strategy meeting in Manhattan on Saturday uh, all afternoon. Got a lot done. Uh, I think people were very happy with it. I know I was. You know, what we're trying to do is create something that's going to be ongoing, that's going to help all the grassroots groups across the country who share the same goals we do. At the rally itself, which took place before the march, what was the atmosphere like? What was your take on it? And who were the speakers who had a chance to address the crowd? I arrived there at 7 o'clock in the morning to begin setting up the stage and the sound system and that kind of thing. And people should know that our contingent was one of only five the entire length of the march that was allowed to have one of these rallies before the march. And that sort of was an indication, I think, of just how strongly the march organizers felt about us, about our contingent, and uh, about how large everybody thought our contingent was going to be, and which it did turn out to be. But you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning, I have to admit, I was a little worried because there were only a couple hundred people there when the rally kicked off with raging grannies who had come from all over the country, from Seattle, from California, as well as the closer chapters in New York and the Northeast. Uh, and they kicked it off with some songs, but there's only a couple hundred people there. But by the end of the rally, an hour and a half later, the entire city block that had been cordoned off for us, for our contingent, was just jam-packed. Uh, you couldn't move. And that's how many people arrived in that hour and a half. It was just really inspiring. Speaking, we had the father of the carbon-free, nuclear-free movement, Dr. Arjun Makajani, who wrote the first book on the concept back in 2007, where he did the, you know, the initial research to show that such an energy future is both feasible and affordable, uh, and things have only improved since then. Uh, we had some terrific young women from the Diné tribe in New Mexico, Leona Morgan, talking about uranium mining, and Yuko Tonohira, uh, who's a Brooklyn Japanese activist, close ties to people in Japan and in Fukushima, and they got up and shared the stage for a very inspiring presentation. We had Julia Walsh, uh, who's uh, a leader in frac action, in New York. Uh, fracking is a huge issue in New York, and uh, we wanted to 
tie together the anti-nuclear movement with the other anti-dirty energy movements because, you know, what we're really all for uh, is clean energy. And we wanted to make that very explicit. Marge Percy, the well-known poet, wrote two poems just for this march, which we read from the stage. Uh, Mary Olson from Nears read those. Chris Williams, who's chair of Nears Board, gave a very rousing kickoff at the end of the rally. And there were other speakers and several musicians as well. It just went extremely well. About how many do you think we had in our contingent? It's hard to say because I don't really know how many people fill a city block, but it was thousands. It takes a lot of people to fill a city block. To give you some concept, there were about 35 blocks along Central Park West, which were used as the staging area. And out of those 35 blocks, uh, 400,000 people marched. So you can fit a lot of people in those city blocks. That's about 10,000 people or more per city block doing some rough math on it. Yeah, and whether we, I don't know if we had 10,000 or not, but because some people arrived late. But yeah, we definitely had thousands. Fabulous. What was most memorable to you about the day? Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, for me personally, it was seeing old friends, actually. Uh, I, I just saw a lot of people that I hadn't seen in some cases uh, a decade or more who came. And, you know, for me, that was the absolute best part. But, but I think, you know, in, in terms of the issue and, and the inspiration, it was just, you know, watching this block fill up with people. We had brought 650 nuclear power no thanks flags and a couple hundred posters don't nuke the climate posters and just watching at 10 o'clock we weren't sure if we thought maybe we brought too many by 11 o'clock we realized we hadn't brought enough uh and you know just watching everybody you know pick those up and then go down the street you know it was just uh, something to see something to behold what do you think was most effective about the march Well, you know, I think the purpose of the march itself was to put climate change back on the national agenda in a big way and say to the governments of the world, you have not dealt with this problem yet. The problem's only gotten worse over time, and, you know, there really is no more time left. And yet, you know, despite what all of us know about it's so obvious that this is a problem that must be dealt with. Climate change has sort of fallen off the national discussion a bit in recent years. And so I think the purpose of the march was to, you know, put this back on the front pages, put this back into the issues that are going to be discussed. And I think it succeeded in doing that. I mean, the issue is back on the front pages with the U.N. summit going on. You know, if this march hadn't happened, how many people would be paying any attention at all to the U.N. summit that's starting today? Probably nobody. So I think the march succeeded in that. From the contingent point of view, what we wanted to do, as I mentioned, was bring the issue of clean energy, of a nuclear-free, carbon-free energy future, and put it on the climate agenda. A lot of, particularly some of the younger climate activists who don't know as much about nuclear power, hear that, well, you know, nuclear reactors are pretty much carbon-free. You know, maybe they're a solution. And we wanted to reach those, our, our fellow marchers, and be able to say, no, that they're not a solution. In fact, going nuclear is counterproductive to addressing climate change. If you go nuclear, we're not going to address climate change in time. When I was watching the the end of the march, watching the people come into the staging area at the end and just seeing by that time, you know, sort of the contingents, which had been very tight at the beginning of the march, by that time they were sort of a little looser and scattered. And just about every contingent had one of our flags flying with it. Uh, or, or one of our signs, and it was just you know, just all over the march. And I think we really reached the other marchers with our message. We can discuss what kind of long-term difference this might make to the clean energy movement and also to our movement. But are you aware, have you seen today Michael Broon from the Sierra Club sent out an email that had a link to a petition to EPA head Gina McCarthy, and it was about 
needing to move away from dangerous fuels. And for the first time in anyone's memory that I know of, he included the N-word, nuclear, in the list of dirty fuels. Were you aware of that? No, I actually got the email, but I haven't had time to read it yet. <laughs> but that's good to hear. Uh, you know, Michael is anti-nuclear himself. The Sierra Club has a growing nuclear-free campaign within the club. And in fact, they're sponsoring a major national conference here in Washington in November, focused entirely on nuclear issues. And we're working closely with them on that. And that's exactly the kind of thing you know, that we were trying to do with this contingent was, like I said, reach the other marchers and also reach a, a lot of the other organizations which have not taken overt, shall we say, position on nuclear power and insert ourselves into that group and show them that we are indeed just as concerned about climate as they are because we are and that we have we are able to mobilize a lot of people and we're able to mobilize them not only to come to New York but also to sign petitions and call politicians and do other kinds of protests and do all the different things that can help affect policy in the coming months and coming years. What is our takeaway as a movement from this experience, this massive march, and where do we go from here? The immediate takeaway is that our movement is big, and it's bigger than probably even most of the people in our movement thought it was. And I think we showed that on Sunday. It's large, and it's growing larger every day. For the relatively immediate future, over the next year or two, and this is what we talked about a lot at the Saturday meeting we had of you know, the activists and the groups that were able to get there early, uh, our focus is really going to move more to the states because it is the states that will be implementing the EPA's new carbon rule when that is finalized next year. That will not happen at the federal level. It will happen at the state level, and the states will have a lot of leeway as to how they're going to meet their carbon reduction goals. There is going to be a lot of pressure in some states to meet those goals with nuclear power, and we have to prevent that from happening. There's going to be a lot of pressure in some states to include nuclear power in clean or renewable energy standards, and we have to prevent that from happening. On the flip side, there's the opportunity in other states to lead the way and promote a 100% clean energy future uh, and show other states how it can be done. So we have that opportunity as well. But the nuclear industry is facing an existential problem at this point. A lot of the nuclear reactors in this country are old, they're aging, they're growing more dangerous the longer they operate, and unlike the promises of the industry in the past, they're actually growing more expensive with age. And, of course, the nuclear industry always said, well, these things are expensive to build, but you know they're less expensive to operate. Well, that is true for a few years, but it doesn't actually last very long. Uh, and they're becoming more expensive to operate. And as costs for electricity generated by renewables plunges the way it's been doing over the past five years or so, as rooftop solar becomes viable to homeowners not only in Southern California but all across the country, as battery storage for rooftop solar is also becoming viable in terms of the economics of it for you know, individual homeowners very quickly. And certainly we've had just in the last 10 days, Tesla Motors, the electric car company, announcement that it's building a, a giant, what they call a gigafactory in Nevada to produce batteries. Well, what most people don't realize is those batteries aren't meant only for Tesla automobiles. They are also meant for solar power systems. Uh, and that is going to rapidly reduce the cost of battery storage, and it makes it extremely easy for homeowners to go off the grid if they want to. You know, put a solar system on the rooftop, get some battery storage, you don't need the utility anymore. That's an existential threat to utilities. Maybe most people won't decide to go off the grid. 
they'll stay on the grid, but instead of buying electricity from the utilities, they'll be selling electricity to the utilities. That's an existential threat to utilities that have these old and increasingly uneconomic reactors that can't compete with rooftop solar. And then you have the larger facilities, the, the big solar power plants, the wind plants, community solar, which allows renters and you know people who live in apartments and things to participate by joining together in co-ops and building solar systems that will power a, a neighborhood or a community or whoever signs up for it. And that's an increasingly growing and effective concept in this country. And the response from these utilities, and, and you know, I, I write a blog called Green World, which is at safeenergy.org. Uh, I started writing it in January, and what we try to do with this blog is look at the nuclear-free, carbon-free energy future, you know, how close we are to getting there, and what are the obstacles in the way, and what good is happening. And just since I started writing this in January, just about every major investment bank and analyst in the world has come out with a major report essentially warning the utilities that renewables are the future. That is where they're going to want, be wanting to put their money in the future, that they're not interested in old fossil fuel plants and they're not interested in old nuclear plants and they're not really interested in new ones either. And even though solar and renewables generally are still a small part of our nation's overall electricity supply, it is a rapidly growing part of it. Most new capacity these days, most new capacity this year, uh, has been renewable in the country. And that trend is going to both continue and actually grow to the point where nearly all new capacity is going to be renewable in this country, and that's going to continue for quite some time. So what these banks and these investment analysts, and I'm talking about organizations like Citibank and UBS and Bloomberg and, you know, extremely establishment entities, and what they're telling the utilities is you'd better wake up because your business is changing and we're going to be part of that change. So some utilities, uh, like NRG Energy, are embracing that change, and others, like Exelon and Entergy, that are very reliant on nuclear power, and some utilities like First Energy, which are very reliant on coal and also have some nuclear, they're resisting that change. And their only option, as they see it, uh, and they're wrong because they could do something different, but what they see is the need to go back to a 1970s energy system in this country where nuclear power reigns supreme, where people pay more for nuclear power just because it's nuclear power, believe it or not. And we've seen that in quotes from people from these companies, where nuclear is included in clean energy standards, which, if that happens, means there will not be investment in clean energy in those states because there won't be room for it. So it's a very large threat we are facing over the next two years, and at the same time, a very large opportunity we are facing over the next two years. But it's all going to be at the state level, and that's what we're going to be organizing and focusing our work on. And, again, that's what our meeting was about on Saturday, and it's where we're going to be taking this nuclear-free, carbon-free movement we're building. You know, Michael, it is rare that I finish one of these interviews and actually feel hopeful. So I want to thank you for providing that particular boost because suddenly something seems possible that perhaps in the past seemed a little vague or not possible at all, and this is very encouraging. You know, it's not only possible, it's inevitable. The question is whether it's going to come in time or not. We have the ability to make that happen, and we're going to do our best to ensure that. That was Michael Marriott, President of Nuclear Information and Resource Service. We'll have a link up to that Sierra Club petition from Michael Brun. You have to hunt in the wording of the actual letter that's being sent to Gina McCarthy to find our N-word, nuclear, but it's there. 
Please, click, sign, and share. Next, I spoke with Gail Payne, a veteran anti-nuclear activist who often marches with Coalition Against Nukes as well as other groups. She's also a graphic designer in New York City, and Gail was responsible for the brilliantly imagined posters carried by Our People in the March that added so much visual clarity to our anti-nuclear message. Gail, you're the woman who came up with that great, clear posture that we have of King Kong and being against coal, oil, nuclear, and gas, which was a great acronym. How did you come up with that design? What was the thinking behind it, and where did it come from? I knew I was going to go to the climate march, and since shutting down nuclear power plants is my main environmental issue that I'm concerned with, so I just started brainstorming, thinking about New York, how to bring some kind of message about nuclear power to the climate march, and I thought of the Empire State Building, and then I remembered that I had heard the expression King Kong from, I believe it was Jean Shaw of Indian Point Safe Energy Coalition. I think she told me Harvey Wasserman coined the term. And I was just thinking about it, and I started looking for images of King Kong. And I found some, and I adapted it in Illustrator. That was it. I thought it was clever. It was almost kind of funny. You know, the King Kong image is such a icon, and it's such a famous movie. I just had the idea, and I thought it was a good one, and I kept working on it. Well, it came across great, and it certainly conveyed a very clear image and gives us an acronym that we can hang future activism on. What was the experience like for you, gathering in the 70s and Central Park West and getting together with the other marchers? It was great. It was really fun. We got there kind of late because the subways were so crowded, we couldn't get on them. We had to wait, and then we kind of had to divide up and be very assertive and push our way in. (laughs) It was just unbelievable. So that's when I kind of had a clue that it would be bigger than predicted. As we waited, it got more and more densely packed, more and more crowded. So I got to meet other activists that I have spoken to or emailed that I had never met in person. I met people from Australia, people from California who came on the climate train. And I just was so pleased that there were so many people marching with the anti-new contingent. It was great. What were some of the highlights for you about the march? At the very end, we made it to the block party. There were mostly young people there. I think a lot of, maybe a lot of people that came on buses had gotten right on the buses to go home because they came 15 hours or, or more some of them. But uh, the block party was full of young people, and there was this music. I was just drawn to the music, and Pete Yarrow, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and other singers were singing like some of my favorite songs, and they weren't just singing, but all these young people were joining in. So to hear this land is your land, where have all the flowers gone, and these young people, you could just tell how moved they weren't moving. They were just like... It was such a moment for them, you know, and for me, even though we were exhausted, it was really moving to have it at the end. That was Gail Payne. We've used the King Kong poster she designed on Nuclear Hot Seat for the past two weeks up on the website, but I think it deserves one more look now that you've heard the story behind it. It will be up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 170. Finally, we talked to Dr. Sheila Parks, a Jewish woman who was part of the Catholic left for at least eight years, where she did nonviolent civil disobedience, mainly against nuclear weapons. These actions landed her in holding cells, courtrooms, jails, and then a year in prison for a plowshares action against the Trident II first strike nuclear weapon. After Fukushima, she returned to no nukes work, this time against nuclear power. She is the convener of the vigil at the Japanese consulate in Boston, where she stands every Thursday in solidarity with the people of Japan. Where did you come from to attend the climate march, and why did you do it? I came from Boston, and how could I not do it would be the question. And even as I knew that, how could I not do it? Never did I dream or imagine that it was going to be this this, this incredible extraordinary peak experience. 
What was it that made it such a peak experience for you? Well, for me, it was happened at the No Nukes Activist meeting on Saturday, and then it really continued into the march. But the march was such a crescendo. You know, being with people of like mind, face-to-face, trying to do something so big and so important and so crucial, and, you know, all being of similar mind, reached my heart and my heart chakra and my mind and soul. Bell Hooks called that the beloved community. You see, I'm crying even as I talk about it, Libby. And, I, I, you know, I have loved that expression, the beloved community, for many decades, and, but I never knew that it was Bell Hooks who said it. There's just something about all of those people who I loved and who loved me, and we were there for, the, you know, not necessarily the exact same purpose, but similar minds and hearts and souls and thoughts and desires to make this world a better place. What could be better than that? Was there a particular moment that stands out for you or a particular experience that was most memorable about this? I think putting on that hazmat suit in my hotel room and knowing that I was going to go out and join with other people wearing that, because I think you know I've been dealing with Fukushima for a year now with a vigil at the Japanese consulate here in Boston, and that Fukushima has been screaming to me for three years. And so putting that on was somehow something just very significant. What do you think was most effective about the march? Well, one, the numbers, of course. And, I mean, if they are saying 400,000, there were probably six, 800,000, a million. And I was in that march in 82 when there was such gridlock. I mean, there were a million of us against nuclear weapons, and we never marched. We just sat in the streets and laughed, and it was so wonderful. So the numbers, there were butterflies and floats and cows and rivers and sunflowers and so many of the groups, it wasn't just people with T-shirts and placards, which is so many of the marches. It was as though this was like a, a, a production that you would want to go see and just watch it because it was so incredible what people had put together to express their deepest thoughts about climate crisis. I mean, it was like block after block after block of creativity, of originality, of people saying this is what you, you cannot do this to the planet, this is what we need to do for the planet, just just incredible stuff. How much do you think that this march will make a difference in the climate change movement and specifically those of us who are working against nuclear power? Ah, uh, well, that's the question. Those are the two questions. I mean, first, I am one of those people who say that when a butterfly flutters her wings, continents move. And I really do believe that. I absolutely believe that with every bone in my body. And it's, you know, knowing that it makes, is one of the things that makes me move like, will this really make a difference? And I say, you know, you're just going to do that anyhow because it does make a difference. And I always say to myself, too, you know, I just have to act. That's my part of it. I have to tell my corner of truth in the world, and then I have to leave the consequences to the universe, which may leave some people screaming as I say that, but I feel I have to be responsible for my own act. Now, the nuclear. <laughs> so, you know, I was saddened to see Bernie Sanders. Essentially, I get his Bernie buzz, and he talked about, you know, he was there at the climate march, and he only talked about fossil fuels. He did not mention nuclear. And that saddened me a great, great deal. And there wasn't enough talk about no nuclear at the march. Pre-March, though, I had heard that Bill McKibben was going to be speaking at Lesley University, which is 10 minutes from my house, and I went, and I went to ask Bill McKibben a question. And I said to him, you know, I'm in the no nuclear group, and we need you to add nuclear to coal, oil, and gas. And Bill McKibben said, I'm not going to. I've dealt with fossil fuels my whole life, and I'm not going to add nuclear. You people have to do that by and I said, well, we are doing that. Of course we're going to do that fight, but we still need you to add nuclear. And he said, no, I've already given you my answer and that I'm not going to do that. My point about that is, that although it's very pessimistic, we have to go and, you know, we have to keep on saying to Bill McKibben and to, I know Harvey Wasserman wrote the open letter to James Hansen, and Bernie Sanders is a much, I feel, easier person to approach that hopefully we could influence faster. But all of us know nuclear people have really got to start organizing very, very carefully, person to person, with emails, with visits, with letters, with all kinds of campaigns to get the no nuclear into the conversation in a way that 
it isn't now, and I don't think it will be from the March. Although I love and, and you know adore Tom Hayden for his you know petition to the United Nations that they have to include it. Anything else? Any thought? Any thoughts of where it goes from here? I think we have to keep organizing. We have to keep on doing what we've been doing, and we have to think of new things to do, and you know, and creative things to do. I mean, we can only do like yesterday, once every I don't know how many years, because of the energy and the everything that it took from people. But we have to remember how many of us are in this together, and how many of us want this to stop, no more coal, oil, nuclear, or gas, and that we were an intergenerational group of people there yesterday, and so many youth, because I do have faith in youth. I mean, that's what had the LGBTQ thing pass all over the world, because the youth is more progressive than many older people. Sad but true. So we have to keep on involving youth in nuclear stuff. All of us have to approach McKibben, Sanders, every person on this planet. It's what I just said. And keep at that no matter what because that is crucial because it has to be on the table much deeper and heavier than it is Libby. And we all have to, every single one of us has to make sure that we are really doing that, each one of us, because it's going to take every one of us. I don't know why. I don't get it, why people think, you know, with Fukushima going into the ocean for three and a half years, I don't understand why people don't get it, but they don't. Yet. That was Dr. Sheila Parks. We'll have a picture of Sheila in her stylish anti-nuke Tyvek hazmat suit up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com. Hey, how do you like the show? Well, if you like it, keep it going. At least help us do so. Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your donations. Yes, yours, sitting right there, listening to it now. We need your help in meeting the bills and staying up and available. Now, you can help us out by making a single donation in the equivalent of a cup of Starbucks. If you want to get posh about it, add the price of a nosh to it. You can also make small recurring payments or put us on your year-end gift-giving list. If you find that Nuclear Hot Seat makes you laugh, think, helps you understand the nuclear issues and cope with what you're understanding so that you're not alone with your awareness, help us keep doing it. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red Donate button. Whatever you can do to help, you have my gratitude. Activist shout-out! Yay! Standing ovation to all the foot sore, horse, and maybe still traveling activists who gave us such a stunning presence at the People's Climate Change Rally. Well done, everyone. Now, moving on, for those of you not aware of academia.edu, it's a site where academics of all stripes post their papers. And we have a wonderful anti-nuclear presence there, a man named Paul Langley. He's been an academic activist on anti-nuclear issues, posting a series of papers that I believe you will find of interest. I know that I did. His latest is a two-part paper on radiation sickness in man. Sorry, it says man, not man and woman, but at least this time. And you can access all of his papers and a lot of others as well by going to academia.edu and signing up. And, of course, we will have that link to the Sierra Club petition that includes, for the first time any of us can remember, a mention of nuclear as being on par with all the other dirty energy sources. Click, sign, and share, please. Not as dramatic as marching, but there are lots of ways to make a difference, and this is an easy one. John Stewart, Booby, you took on climate change on Monday, September 22nd, and whew! You hit it with ferocity, precision, and with another one of those new sly nuclear comments that you are becoming so fond of. This one was part of a joke as to why actors Mark Ruffalo and Edward Norton were both at the march. It was because they both played the Incredible Hulk, meaning they both had direct experience with the impact of gamma radiation. Big laugh, John. You're on a roll but you're still missing the big, fat, sweet spots of vulnerability within the nuclear military-industrial complex. 
I can get you there, so call me and I'll fill you in on all the details. Meanwhile, John, add a boy and keep going. And everyone, remember that when you retweet and favor each week's Nuclear Hot Seat tweets, they immediately go to John Stewart's hashtag new CNN shows. So keep those tweets, those retweets, and those favorites coming. Here's today's final thought. It has been the best of times and worst of times in my life today. We are not going to discuss my car. But as I stated on the interview with Michael Marriott, I was cheered and heartened by our interview, by what he said, and by the vision that maybe, just maybe, we're in the process of making huge progress against nukes. While I'd reported on individual stories, I'd missed the pattern that the world's financial institutions are saying no to nukes and wanting to invest only in renewables. Great point, Michael. Then there was Michael Brune's petition to Gina McCarthy with nuclear listed by the Sierra Club as a dirty fuel on par with coal, gas, and oil. The event in New York served to help us build awareness with other branches of the climate change movement bring our issues to awareness of marchers and to those still standing on the sidelines trying to cross the street. It even helped our own activists meet each other in person after years of virtual community. At home in California, I watched on live stream. And even though I only saw one of our flags and missed our contingent completely, I still felt like I was part of something important. As Michael Marriott said, people would probably not even be paying attention to the U.N.'s climate change conference if it hadn't been for this massive march. And now, our anti-nuclear message is getting a seat at the table. Is it enough? Is it on time? Is it even possible to turn this around? Don't ask me. I'm just a singer in a rock and roll band. But isn't it nice for once to feel a smattering of hope instead of endless depression. It may not be much, but I'll take it for now and keep working towards more. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, September 23rd, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from... <gasps> Ianinews.com, LeFigaro.fr, Japan Times, Kyunghyang Shinmun, which is Korean, Fukuleaks.org and SimplyInfo.org, DeUnRenard.wordpress.com, Asahi.com, Manichi, Xinhua, Kyoto News, IRSN, CBS News, NewAgeBD.net, EN.REA.RU, Reuters, KRQE TV, NBC News, King 5 News Seattle, and Ace Reporter Susanna Frame. World Meteorological Organization, Central Institute for Meteorology and Geodynamics, NOAA Fisheries, World Nuclear News, and the ever-sexy with a great personality Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. You guys rock. So join us. Friend us. Tweet to Jon Stewart about us. It's fun. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weber. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can also find it on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com. And you can subscribe to Nuclear Hot Seat on iTunes so you get each week's episode as it becomes available. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. Could you tell? So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Please don't use Facebook. They tend to get lost. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi, and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed for you, yes, you, as long as you are a not-for-profit group, blog, or website. Just make certain you include the name of the podcast and the website. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call, so don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking?
Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking.